Okay, can everybody hear me? Can you find? Excellent. It's the first time I've ever had a microphone, so <laughs> quite exciting. Um, hello, and thank you for having me. My name is Lisa Chambers, and I work for the Open Knowledge Foundation. Um, just before I start talking about what I'm actually here to talk about, I'll tell you why I'm here um, and how data journalism is actually connected to the work of the Open Knowledge Foundation. Uh, the Open Knowledge Foundation started in the UK in about 2004. Uh, we exist to promote open access to data. Um, so, uh, open data in the sense that in, in the sense that we mean it means data that anybody is free to use, reuse, or redistribute. Uh, we don't just do data; we also do content. Um, and in the remit of content comes into uh, comes come things like open educational resources. Um, and the data journalism handbook, which I'm going to talk to you today about, is uh, an open educational resource which is aimed at journalists and aims to teach them how to use data. Um, we work in three large areas, the largest one being uh, open government probably. Uh, I work on a project called Open Spending when I'm not doing data journalism stuff, um, where we're trying to get hold of all of the government financial information in the world, put it in one place, visualize it, and make it comprehensible to people. Um, we also work in open academia, open research, where we try and encourage uh, scientists, researchers, to open up their data behind their research and make it available so that people can cross-check their results, build on their research, don't replicate it, um, and also encourage them to put their, uh, publish their papers in open access journals. And we also work in the field of open cultural heritage. So when copyright expires, in, in, in we teach people what they can do with uh, the material that it has passed into the public domain. So those are, that's basically what the, the Open Knowledge Foundation does. And uh, the way it does it is it builds tools, uh, projects, and communities. And we'll talk about those a bit a bit later. Uh, there are legal tools, we build licenses and we teach people that it's important not only to publish your data on the internet, if you're a government if you, or if you're an NGO, it's also important to tell people what they can do with it. So we encourage people to put, um, to put licenses on their data which tells people what they, what they can do with it um, and if it's open or if it's, if it's not open. Uh, specifically, I should mention with open licenses, we've been asked this numerous times uh, since, we, since we've been here. We, count, uh, we don't count non-commercial licenses as open, so uh, any license which stops commercial bodies from uh, using data, we don't count as an open license, so I just thought I would mention that at that point. Um, one, of our biggest, one of our biggest projects is uh, a project called CCAN, which is a data, an open source uh, data repository. It's been used by the UK government uh, for data.gov.uk. Uh, it's also about to be used at the European level um, for publicdata.eu, uh, the, the European data repository. And uh, besides actually encouraging governments to open up their data, we also kind of perform the interpretive role. So we actually take the data, process it, and put it into a form that people can uh, understand a lot, a lot more easily. So this is the predecessor of the project that I work on. It's a screenshot from the project Where's My Money Go, uh, where you can basically you can put in your uh, your income. Can you still hear me? <laughs> you can put in your 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 yearly income, and it will give you on a daily basis information on how much you contribute to different sectors of society. So this is kind of a nice segue into, um, into data journalism as well, because I'm going to talk a bit later about how uh, journalism is no longer static words on a page, it's also about showing people in the way that's most relevant to them what data, what, what, the, what data means for them. Um, the final project that I'm going to talk about, um, my, project, my colleague Laura, who sat down here at the front, uh, who you could have cost if you're interested in it, um, is that besides working with governments to open up their data and interpreting it for them, we also want to build, uh, build people's data literacy skills. So um, when we're talking about data journalism, that's not, only, that's not only the journalists themselves, that's also the readers. So we care that... Um, we care that the readership actually demands 
to see the working behind the, the news articles. They're not, they're not happy to see a, a large number printed in their, in their local newspaper. They want to know exactly where it's come from and how they got to, how they got to that, that number. So, with that in mind, that brings us on to how we get to the topic of data journalism. And what I just, what I just mentioned is exactly the reason why we were motivated to put together this, this handbook. The Data Journalism Handbook is an open educational resource, which you can find online at, uh, the easiest URL is ddjbook.org, and uh, stands for Data Driven Journalism Book.org. And it's available under a Creative Commons license. It's CC by SA, which means that anybody can use it. Um, anybody can, as long as they attribute us, and if they, uh, we also encourage people to remix it, and if they remix it, as long as they uh, release it under the same license, uh, they can do whatever they, whatever they like with it. And it aims to, <laughs> I've got <you. laughs> no, before, before I tell you what data journalism is, I'm actually going to tell you that there is no such thing as data journalism. Um, why I say that there is no such thing as data journalism is, uh, we think that data journalism is a misnomer. Um, if, you use a tele if you're a journalist and you use a telephone in your reporting, you don't call it telephone journalism. In today's modern age, we don't believe that, data, that, that journalists can get by without using data. So we think that every journalist should be uh, equipped with the skills and know which tools they can use in order to be able to, uh, in order to, be able to use, use data. Um, so we, we would like it, it's very fashionable at the moment to use the name data journalism and uh, in, the, in the States, they've been talking about computer-assisted reporting for a very, very long time. And we just like it to become common practice, <laughs> essentially. So, now I've told you that there isn't a such thing as data journalism, I'm going to tell you what we wrote a book about. Um, so, one of the biggest headaches that we have at the Open Knowledge Foundation is uh, journalists, for a long time, have... Uh, not treated uh, data as a source. They still look for uh, things like interviews. They look to have their own their own sources of information. Um, and we teach them new ways of getting data. We'll talk a bit more about what those are uh, a little bit later. New ways of understanding and working with the data. We're particularly keen. Um, so there are there are organisations which are very famous for doing data journalism. Things like the Guardian in the UK, the New York Times. But if you're not if you're not a multi million pound organisation. Can you get started with? Can you get started with data journalism? Is there anything that you can do as a as a, a small local newspaper to uh, to get started with with data journalism? And as I mentioned before, with the uh, where's my money go visualization, I don't believe that da that journalism is any longer a static words on a page. People expect more than just prose. So how can we teach journalists to deliver information in a in a more engaging and more beautiful way, essentially. Um, the reason it's important now is because we're kind of in an information age. Journalists before were more of hunter-gatherers. They had to fight. They had to fight for their resources. Inf information was scarce. Now you guys have a Right to Information Act. We have a Freedom of Information Act as well. There's also a huge amount going on in the field of government transparency. Uh, this just isn't the case anymore. And one of the things that is most frustrating in uh, the, the line of work that we do is journalists not wanting to uh, kind of collaborate. And you, when they have they have one set, one data set and another journalist has another data set, they hold up, keeping holding on to those those data sets and not sharing them because the value, the most powerful stories that have come, data driven data driven stories that have come out of. Uh, the data-driven journalism movement, if you like, have been ones where people have combined data from se several sources. Um, so we want to encourage journalists to build a kind of a commons of data and see that whilst it may not be them in the first instance that gets the, gets the scoop, um, they can come back and they can search later on in, the, in the, these common databases and things like that um, and get the, get the story a bit later on. So, as I mentioned before, uh, you can't actually see that. This is, um, this is a site called datacatalogs.org. This is an, uh, a kind of a catalogue of catalogues. And it 
uh, lists as many open government data portals as we know about. Um, we teach journalists about, um, first and foremost, <laughs> the most easy way to get data is that a lot, a lot of the time it's already there. So we teach them where to look for it, and we teach them how to use uh, open government data, open government data portals, um, and freedom of information requests and things like that. Um, this is not something um, I, I, I put this slide in here because um, it's 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 not what we do. Um, this is a visualisation of the WikiLeaks war logs um, because where where we. Um, where before the, the journalists were, if you like, hunter gatherers and they had to had to kind of forage and hold on to their data, we now end up in a situation where they're absolutely drowning in it. Um, and so this this is a really, really interesting project. It's called the Every Blue Project. It's um, built by a guy called Jonathan Stray at the Associated Press. Um, and it deals with kind of the inverse of the, the hunter gatherer hunter gatherer problem, where journalists are now confronted with so, so many documents and data that they have to be able to um, work out where they should even start or if they should even start reading the documents. So what the Overview Project does is it groups together, it finds common words in documents that may be of interest to, um, to journalists, and it shows them uh, which documents they're located in. So they can focus in just on this cluster of, of documents if they're only interested in things which, they, which include the word handcuffed. So it's about speeding up fact-checking as well for time-pressed journalists because they don't have the time to mess around. Um, and it's also about crowdsourced data. So one of the uh, one of the, the news ways which we're finding that journalists are getting hold of data is by actually asking people. And with tools like Shahidi, which you see behind me, um, and even really simple things like Google Forms, we see that people are actually putting surveys out there and asking their readers and following up after after they've put out uh, an interesting story to find out what their readers, what their readers thought of it. Um, and it's, it's, changing, it's changing journalism because they can get their stories a lot faster and a lot more accurate than they, they ever could from a small handful of sources before. So uh, why we're here and what, we, um, uh, what we'd what we really like to get out of the, the fifth elephant and uh, talking to you guys is that we believe that data journalists sit at the kind of the intersection between several groups. Um, they have a lot to learn from coders, data geeks, um, and even kind of traditional academics. A lot of the first Pulitzer Prizes, which were won for data-driven stories, came from journalists who kind of looked at methods and techniques which historians were using to analyze and work with, work with data. Um, and they tried to apply them to their own work and found that actually that's really, really interesting. So what we're keen to, what we're keen to find out is in India and uh, with, the, with the work that, that you guys do, is there anything that you really wish that journalists knew that makes your life really, really easy when you're working with data? What is it? What are the tools um, which, are, which are most useful to you guys and could they learn anything from you? Um, so... This leads me to so how long have I got? <laughs> got some more time. Excellent. Uh, this leads me to why the, how the the data journalism handbook came out because it was um, not the project that we originally intended it to be. Uh, it started life as a, uh, a kind of what we intended to be a, a two day a two day project, and we started it at Mozilla Festival in London in 2011 in November. Um, we basically planned to write a book in two days. We got uh, a group of journalists from all over the world, the New York Times, um, the Guardian, uh, loads and loads of, of people from all over the world, put them in a room, locked them in there, wouldn't let them out until they read them book. Um, and at the, end of the, at the end of the two days, we had about 20,000 words from about 35 or 55 contributors, I think. Um, and it just seemed like such a shame not to keep going with it. So. Over the, over the next six months, we embarked on this enormous crowdsourcing, what's essentially an enormous crowdsourcing project, where we went around and we found what we thought were some of the, the, the key uh, data-driven data stories and data-driven journalists from around the world. 
um, and we asked them to write about their experience. We didn't want to write a kind of a, a manual because we realised that that would date really quickly. Um, so we didn't want to kind of write about the fashionable tools of the time. And what we did was we compiled case studies, and it's meant to get journalists excited about the prospect of using data in their work, um, rather than telling them, as I'm sure you know, no book can turn one person into a, a fully fledged data journalist. But um, it's a it's a good start, and it's meant to inspire them to get started. Um, so we've touched on this before, but um, it deals with things like where can you find data, how can you request data, what tools you can use once you've got hold of your data, and importantly, how do you find how do you find stories and data? Do you go in with a hypothesis, a hunch, and looking for something, or do you just kind of fumble around and hope that you're hope that you're going to find it? What's the what are the, the ways that other people have managed to do this in the past? Um, so I don't know how well you can see that, which is a shame. This is a, um, uh, the, a poster with the overview of the entire book, um, where we, we basically we start from collecting, kind of crowdsourcing all of the different interpretations of what data journalism is, and it ranges, it ranges in everybody's minds as to what the definition actually should be. It can be, like I mentioned, people say, it's just journalism where you use data. Um, another definition will say it's just journalism done well. And another definition will say it's, a, it's journalism with visualizations and sexy uh, infographics and things like that. Um, and then we move on to look at actually how data journalism changes newsrooms. Because uh, as, uh, I mean, I've been talking, I've been talking to uh, people as we go through, and it seems that the media in India seems fairly healthy. <laughs> that might be disputable, but um, as far as I can tell, people seem to think that the the media is doing pretty well in India. In the UK and in other parts of Europe, it's it's struggling. It's really <laughs> Ooh, <sorry. laughs> um, a lot of the a lot of the media has moved online, and uh, people are struggling to work out new business models which which revolve around it. Can you still hear me? Is my microphone going? <laughs> Um, uh, so uh, we look at new business models, and they can be anything from uh, actually doing kind of consultancy consultancy work around data, because all of a sudden you've built this fantastic resource <coughs> that people actually want to want to access and use, um, publishing, and things like that. Um, also, we look at we look at things like is it is it something that uh, is data journalism something which you need to intrinsically upskill in, in, your, in your newsroom? Do you actually need to train journalists to uh, have new skills? <coughs> or is it actually more beneficial to buy in the talent, if you like? Is it, is it better to train journalists how to code? Or is it better to get coders in um, to, to help you out with it? What can you do on your own and what do you need additional help with? Um, then we move on to actual ways of getting data, um, freedom of information requests, I think, um, I think you call them RTI requests, is that right? Um, open data portals, uh, there's a small amount on scraping as well, um, which uh, we tell people to use with caution, but if people won't give you information the way that you ask them when you ask them nicely, it seems a pity not to be able to get it any other way. Um, and then crowdsourcing, again. Um, there's a small amount on statistics and understanding data, because um, I'm sure you know that journalists, some are absolutely fantastic at maths, and some of them are kind of maths butchers. So there's a small amount on uh, on data literacy and basic stats for um, for journalists, common mistakes, things like that. Um, and the final the final section deals with uh, new ways of. Uh, telling stories with data, so interactive maps. Um, we look at we look at some kind of proprietary tools, some free tools uh, that that people are, are using in their work. A lot of examples from the fantastic work of the Guardian Data Blog, um, and also how you engage with your engage with your community. We want news to be more of a dialogue, not just putting the not just journalists always putting out their their stories and into a void. Like how do they actually, after they put their story out, how do they get feedback from people to build on it and make it into a better story next time? Um, or perhaps the next chapter of the same story. 
So, um, it's online. Um, there, there is an online version for free. There is also now um, a print and ebook version available via O'Reilly. Um, and it's available, like I said, at ddjbook.org. And if anybody has any questions about this or about the other work of the Open Knowledge Foundation, I would be very, very happy uh, to speak to you about it. Laura and I have a table upstairs with lots of stickers, um, and we're also having a um, meetup. Uh, I'll this one first. We're having a meetup next week on Tuesday with the Data Meet guys um, on the topic of open data. Uh, is that Jager? Um, the address is the address is on here. And there's a, a Bitly link. If you're interested in joining us, we'd love to see you. Um, and we're also planning on uh, having an entire uh, couple of days of activities around data journalism at our, what will be, annual conference in Helsinki in September, if you're interested in learning more about it. Um, thank you very much for having me, and I hope that we'll keep talking. <laughs>